LLMs are not as creatively imaginative as us. They're also not as able to ground their lame imaginations in reality as we are. Uh, like yes. the, how creativity works is you, you generate a bunch of cool random stuff, then you test it against observed reality. And if you can't test against observed reality, you better limit your imagination. You'll be completely insane. Well, it gets straight into epistemology too, because like this whole idea of prediction, it's very closely related to that idea of abstraction, right? If you can just observe general phenomena and then abstract out a principle, you know, like well, force equals mass times acceleration, and this explains the motions of so many things short of the quantum domain, then that becomes like a very useful tool, an explanatory uh, tool for interpreting what you see in the world. We still use F equals MA in the quantum domain also. Oh, we do? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Just your, I mean, your ways of the kinds of forces are different right. although I, below plank length you can't measure well, below it, plank so length you can't measure it yeah, yeah. I, I you know i i spent some time once when i was much younger and I had more free time mm -hmm. fleshing out how would the universe work if f equals mv instead of f equals what MA. is mv velocity what a force oh. is proportional to velocity yeah, instead of velocity. acceleration interesting like you can still have a universe right but yeah. everything works very differently because velocity is speed and direction and yeah, acceleration yeah, yeah. is rate of change of speed right, right so the fact that force is acceleration is why chemistry works right mm. but on the other hand you could still have alternate universes with different foundational physical laws which is, is is yeah it's quite interesting you would imagine at some point we could build a virtual reality like that you can port yourself into it and then, right, right, and then right. see how crazy it drives you yeah right? you will cope with that better than chat gpt yeah right. i mean we will all cope with it very badly yeah but we will cope with it better than chat gpt because we can pivot and Ye leap into the great unknown to a greater extent than yeah. a system like an llm with it's limited abstraction. Is it the imagination? Is that the human imagination doing that? Imagination is part of it. Thing. Yeah, but but there's yeah. an interesting duality between imagination and factual grounding. LLMs are not as creatively imaginative as us. They're also not as able to ground their lame imaginations in reality as we uh -huh. are. And these two work together, right? Like yes. how creativity works is you, you generate a bunch of cool random stuff. Yeah. Then you test it against observed reality. Yeah. And if you can't test against observed reality, you better limit your imagination. You'll be completely... <laughs> Right, right, completely right. insane, which happens yeah. to some people, yeah. of course, right? Yeah. They have defects in reality discrimination, and then yeah. we call them schizophrenic and, sure, and, and so sure, forth. Sure. So LLMs both lack the generative creativity people uh -huh. have, and they lack the instinct for evaluating their ideas against observed realities, yeah. right? And I mean, obviously, these are both super important aspects yeah. of being a human-like general intelligence, which is why I think you need to add some other things on to LLMs to get a human-like AGI. Like, you need to add on something that's more creative creative, yeah. like an evolutionary algorithm, you need to add on something. It could be a logic engine or it could be a different kind of neural net, but you need to add on something that models the world and compares mm -hmm. ideas to the world. Right now, yeah. I think you can do that. I don't think I don't think it's a fundamental obstacle. I think you can do it with, with digital computers, yeah. can, but it is different than just training bigger and bigger language models. How important, because I recall something, paraphrasing something Carl Friston said, like the, the organism's anatomy is a map of its environment. How important is embodiment to intelligence? essential? Well, my friend Pei Wang, who's been an AGI researcher for, I guess, as long as I have since the 80s, he wrote a paper once called A Laptop is a Body. Okay. So, I mean, the point is, yeah, we're not talking about AIs living in the spiritual domain with no body. I mean, mm -hmm. the computer also has sensors, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also actuating, like the screen yeah. is impacting the world. So, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, there's inputs and outputs. And I mean, the informational richness of the input and output is important. And the ability to act on the world and then and see what your action did and integrate mm -hmm. that into your model of the world. All that is important. That doesn't mean you need a body in the sense of like a robot body that mm -hmm. looks like a, a human's body. I mean, if you think about it, the internet itself has an insane amount of sensors all over the place mm -hmm. and an insane ability to take actions all over the world, right? So I can mean, you, the, can you double the internet click on is that? a body. It's just a different body than ours. Can you double click on that term action? That's a very important term in economics. And I'm not clear on how inanimate objects perform form action like i can't imagine say if all the people vanish the snap of a finger well then the internet computers these things aren't going to take actions anymore is that correct i guess that depends on how you're defining an action for sure yeah, yeah mises says uh the use of means to pursue ends i was going to try to take this into yeah, yeah, another yeah. perspective on intelligence it's like okay you can navigate solve a complex set of problems across a number of complex domains but isn't also an aspect of intelligence deciding which goals you're going to pursue in the first place? I mean, I think that decision is 
just another form of self-organizing dynamic in mm-hmm. a complex system. So another way to define intelligence, getting into the philosophy of it, my friend uh, Weaver, a.k.a. David Weinbaum, mm-hmm. wrote a PhD thesis called Open-Ended Intelligence. What he's looking at is an open-ended intelligence is a system that self-organizes so as to maintain its own boundaries and its own mm-hmm. integrity and also seeks to self-transform and modify itself mm-hmm. into something going beyond, fundamentally mm-hmm. beyond what it was before. And there's a certain dialectic between these right. things, right? Sure. And he sees all life forms going back to single cells and mm-hmm. maybe before as manifesting this sort of dialectic between individuation and self-transcendence. Yes. And making up new goals to pursue is then part of the self-organizing activity. And yeah. the decision process is also, I mean, you would have dug enough into the philosophy of free will to know that when we think we're deciding something is not actually when our brain is making the decision, mm-hmm. right? Like you've seen these experiments of Michael Gazzaniga with split brain patients. This is very interesting. So what he did in this case, he looked at patients who had corpus callosomectomies, yeah, like yeah. the two half of their brains had been split to mm-hmm. stop them from having epileptic seizures that would kill them. The result is when you whisper into one ear, only that part of the brain hears it. When you mm-hmm. whisper into that ear, only that part of the brain hears mm-hmm. it, right? So he would go, he would whisper into the right ear, go out in the hallway and get a Coke from the Coke machine, right? Mm-hmm. And only this half of the brain heard it, right? Then the mm-hmm. guy would go do it. The guy would come back with the Coke. Mm-hmm. He'd whisper in this ear, why did you just go out in the hallway? Go, oh, I was really thirsty. Mm. So I decided to go get the Coke, right? So it's rationalization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they really felt like they yeah. had that half of the brain made that decision like it felt like it had made that decision Interesting. but actually in that case you had then you could show them the video they're like oh shit right Mm. so when you benjamin lebay a neuroscientist did some studies like this in many cases it's about half a second before we feel like we're making the decision the unconscious brain actually (laughs) makes that decision and he did some simple experiments like you know click a clicker to make a little pointer stop and we thought we decided at one point but we actually decide yeah a little bit earlier now that doesn't mean there's no decision process that's meaningful mm-hmm. right it just means that the acutely conscious decision process that we feel like is making the decision is a sort of shadow of the unconscious process that is actually making the decision this reminds me of a quote from friedrich nietzsche which mm-hmm. was consciousness is like the army commander taking responsibility after the fact for the decision of his troops right 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 and right so, right, right, right. so it makes sense it just it means that free will in some sense is an illusion but not in every sense right like there still is a sort of decision making dynamic in a human's brain Mm -hmm. or a dog's brain which is not there in a rock now whether that dynamic is there in a hurricane i don't know yeah this is where because that that is a complex self-organizing system it's doing stuff you could say in its early stages of formation it's individuating and self-transcending and and growing now does it have an unconscious goal it's pursuing like i'm well yeah and maybe where you know, I've seen philosophers draw the line between living and non-living systems as that of autopoiesis, right? So like an or- a hurricane is self-organizing, but what a hurricane won't do is seek out conditions that further its self-organization. Are you sure? Well, it'll just make landfall and destroy itself. If a hurricane was like trying to optimize for its survivability, it'd probably just circle in the ocean for a long time, right? If that were its only goal, but that's not our only goals either. I mean, we can suicide True. bomb, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess the point... They're not the same, but there's an interesting fact... I've been playing with recently, which is so the the equations for optimal control. So there there are certain equations that govern the system trying to get from a starting point to an ending point. Mm -hmm. I find the most efficient way to get from start to the end. This is Mm -hmm. called dynamic programming or optimal Mm -hmm. control. Now, the optimal control equations turn out to be equivalent to the fluid dynamic equations. Interesting. Like the Navier-Stokes equation under underlying fluids. So you can you can map the one in map the one into the other by by a certain Is that related to the traveling salesman problem? No. No, it's no. not. Okay. Well, the traveling salesman problem, it's another graph problem, right? Because yeah. the optimal control is equivalent to finding the shortest path through a graph from point right. A to point B. Yeah. The traveling salesman is not the shortest path from A to B. The traveling salesman is finding the most efficient path to visit a whole bunch of nodes in the graph. Yeah, it's the shortest so it, path to achieve the goal. But it's true, but yeah. it, it's a little bit different. But there's a theorem that if you look at what fluids are doing, yeah. like air or water or mm-hmm. hurricane or, or waves or whatever, then the dynamics on the space of volume preserving transformations on the fluid are optimal control. So mm-hmm. in, in a sense, mathematically, every fluid is making a decision process of how to organize itself mm-hmm. step by step. 